Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so hi, everyone. Again, thank you for joining today. My name is Thomas Young, and I'm part of the Energizing Rural Communities Prize Administration Team at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL for short. And today's meeting is part of a series of virtual trainings uh, for the Energizing Rural Communities Prize. You can find more details, uh, register for upcoming trainings, and view recordings from past trainings on the Energizing Rural Communities Prize webpage, which is at AmericanMadeChallenges.org. I'll share a direct link to that here in just a moment. And today's training is about the state and local planning for energy platform known as SLOPE. It's a free and easy to access online platform that helps energy planners at state and local levels make data-driven decisions to achieve their community's energy goals. Your presenter today is Megan Day here at NREL. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please go ahead and add them to the chat and we will have a Q&A session after the presentation. All right, with that, Megan, I will let you go ahead and introduce yourself and take it from there. Hi folks, thanks Thomas, I really appreciate it. And I'm excited to be with you here today and congratulations on making the phase two of this project and competition. And so today we'll be talking about clean energy planning with SLOPE, the state and local planning for energy platform. And we'll try to make sure that it's relevant for you and your work. Here, I see some responses coming in for those of you who didn't hear Thomas. We're hoping to hear your name, your project type, and which county you are in, what kind of location. So I see some Texas, Alaska, Oregon. Great to see you on the line and keep it coming. We'd like to see who's here and, and what you're working on. Um, so let's take a deep dive into SLOPE and figure out how it can be useful for you in your work. And we'll try to look up some specific data in a live demo soon enough and uh, figure out some data for your particular jurisdictions. So today we'll tackle a slope overview and then we'll take some polls. Who's here? What are you working on? And we will look at a scenario planner overview. That's one of the components on slope. And then we'll take an overview of the data viewer, the other component. And then most of the time here today, we'll do a live demo and we'll take a look at the site and we'll ask you to follow along and explore the data for your own jurisdiction and see what we find and make sure that it's relevant for your work and your projects. And we'll be sure to save some time for questions and answers at the end. So feel free to enter questions in the chat as we go along and we can get back to them. Um, and certainly raise your hand if you have something immediate on the, the type of data that we're looking at right then and there. And we'll try to tackle that as we go, because we have a, a good intimate group here today. So looking forward to a good conversation and interaction. All right. So as far as the state and local planning for energy or slope platform, we are designing slope and delivering it to be basically a first stop shop. Slope helps provide locally jurisdictions jurisdictionally resolved data, right? So we're trying to give you the context and identify opportunities and potential that are specific to your loca location and uh, context. So as Thomas said, Slope is a free and easy to access and use online platform, free being the operative word here. Um, we're trying to help energy planners like yourselves make data-driven decisions to achieve energy goals. And so, as I mentioned, there's two different components on slope. One is the scenario planner, where you can explore the impacts of different energy transition scenarios on energy consumption, emissions, and costs at county, state, and national scales. So again, this is a big picture. What are your opportunities and potential? And you can use all of these visualizations as well as the data sets. You can download them and use them in your analysis in your outreach and education, and grant proposals, you name it. This is meant to be used with attribution and uh, to support you in your work. The other component is the data viewer, where you can dive into over 40 different data sets at the city, county, state, and sometimes census tract level on renewable energy, energy efficiency, and sustainable transportation, as well as jobs and equity and building in environment and so lots and lots of data there that we hope can help you in your work. 
Slope is supported by the Office of State and Community Energy Programs, or SCEP, uh, which is part of the Department of Energy in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. And it also is supported by multiple different technology offices that you can see down here at the bottom. So it is put together by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL, but it is supported by and made possible by these sponsors. And that's why it's free. It's your uh, Department of Energy and National Renewable Energy Lab. So let's now take a look at, I'm going to leave this up one up and we'll take a look at two polls here to get a sense of who's here and what you guys are up to. Um, so first of all, we want to hear what kind of an organization are you representing today? We're looking to see, are we hearing from local government folks, tribal government, university professors, students, administrators, researchers, uh, community-based organizations, financing entity, um, a business or entrepreneur, a utility or other. I'd love to hear what kinds of folks are, are joining us today. And uh, second, we wanna hear what kind of project are you planning? So are you looking at different types of renewable energy projects? energy efficiency, sustainable transportation or transportation electrification, um, or another kind of project. So looking to hear what, who you represent, what type of organization are you representing here? And then what kind of a project are you planning? So we have a couple more seconds to hear um, because I don't see too many folks have answered yet, but uh, take a look at that poll and let us know who's here, where you're coming from, so that we can focus the rest of our time together on some of the types of projects and technologies and um, interventions that, that you're focused on. So I see only two have answered so far. If that's different on anyone else's. Yeah, we have um, 10 out of 12, and I think the other two are you and me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mine's just not keeping up. Sounds good. Then let's take a look at the results. Thanks. <laughs> okay. We have interesting, not, many, not any jurisdictions, local jurisdictions. We have a couple of financing entities as well as other. Um, so uh, interesting to hear what kind of other. So maybe if you want to enter that into, oh, I see Farmers Conservation Alliance. Um, intertribal community. So some good other entities here that I think we have. If you haven't already shared that in the chat, um, we'd love to hear what kinds of entities in the other category that you represent. And let's go down here to what kinds of projects. We've got leading the pack ground mounted PV. Um, I'm a former utility scale PV developer, so I love to talk about Ground Mount PV. So we'll get into that. Um, followed by rooftop PV and building energy efficiency. Great. We'll take a look at that. Other renewable energy. Good to know. Um, if you want to enter in your location and what other type of renewable energy you're looking at, that would be interesting to hear. No wind, I see. Um, some battery energy storage potentially shared or combined with that solar and some building energy efficiency and transportation. So a great cross-section. We will tackle all of that, except for maybe a focus on wind because nobody's here from that. <laughs> all right, thank you folks for sharing that information. It's great to know who's here and what you're interested in and how we can tailor this data to make more uh, relevant and applicable information for you and your projects. Okay, we are going to take a quick look at the two major components of slope, and then we will get into this live demo. Um, so first up is the scenario planner. So we're really excited to deliver county level data, which is pretty unprecedented, um, that takes a look at different scenarios through 2050 and what happens. Again, we're looking at the big picture, the context, the potential of different types of scenarios into the future. 
And sometimes I get ahead of myself and I'm really excited about this data and I'm showing all the great like information we can deliver and people are like, hold on, where do you get this information? We don't trust you. <laughs> Why should I pay any attention? So this is to say that the scenario planner is built on the foundation of seven different flagship models as well as studies that were developed, some of them over 20 years or more and including the Regional Energy Deployment System, or REEDS, as well as things like the Distributed Generation Market Demand, or DGEN, ResStock, Comstock, looks at the very, in very much detail as on the building sector and efficiency and interventions there. Transportation is something that we're really excited to bring in, right? We're, we're combining the building environment and the energy consumption in buildings with transportation energy consumption and different scenarios and how those sectors interact moving forward into the future in these scenarios. But I do want to cautious that any caution that any projection or, um, or or scenario in the future is by definition wrong, right? Nobody can know the future. And so what we do here is we provide different scenarios that have very clear assumptions going into them built on some uh, really noteworthy and world-class models to look at what might change in the future in terms of consumption, emissions, and costs under these different scenarios to help you plan and prioritize. So we take all those seven different models, we combine them with data from the US Energy Information Administration and other demographic information, and we come out with 25 unique different scenarios and that helps you understand what your potential and opportunity are down to the county level. So we'll take a look at the scenario planner first, and then we'll take a look at the data viewer in the demonstration. So the data viewer has over 40 different data sets, and it covers things like consumption by sector, as well as efficiency, potential, system costs and emissions, buildings and energy consumption, and con data on the built environment, renewables, sustainable transportation, transportation electrification, costs of energy and equity data. So these are all the different types of data on the data viewer. And we'll take a look at pretty much something from all of them. There is a concept I wanna introduce before we dive into this, the demo here. And that is what is technical generation potential? There's a lot of folks here who are looking at storage and solar, both ground mount and rooftop and some other technologies. Um, and much of the data that we deliver on the slope is framed as technical generation potential. So if you see this pyramid here, we want to kind of work up from the bottom. Resource potential is taking solar as an example, all the solar energy that falls on a particular area or location that could be converted into solar energy or electricity. Um, but obviously all the land that's there is not suitable for capturing that solar energy and converting it into electricity or other heat or usable energy. So technical potential is just the next step up. It's basically looking at excluding all of the areas that are not suitable for solar or wind or other types of technology development and taking those out of that generation potential. So it creates a very high number. It's so we try to frame it as this is a very upper bound for planning purposes. So probably not ever going to generate more than the technical generation potential because it, it assumes that you've used all suitable area for whatever technology you're looking at. So we're excluding water bodies, unless it's floating solar. We're excluding steep slopes in the case of solar. We're excluding urbanized areas, roads, protected lands. We're excluding parks and uh, other areas where you can't develop. And so we're combining that resource potential with the suitable land, and that's your technical generation potential. After that, you get narrower and narrower as you consider economic potential, what are, what are the costs, and what are the um, potential for that technology um, economically. And then beyond that, you get to market. Is anyone going to buy this energy? Is there a market for it, regardless of the economic market cost, et cetera? So... So that potential gets narrower and narrower, but we'll be focused on technical generation potential for most of this data. Okay, now 
I hear, uh, see a question here, how is private property used or excluded? It is included. Um, so all of the technical generation potential includes private property. It will exclude some things like public parks, protected wetlands or habitat um, or that kind of thing. But private property is included as long as it is suitable for generation and development. Um, so good question, thank you. All right, now we're gonna dive into the live demonstration. And so I wanna hear from you as we go along, if you'd like to follow along, um, I, Thomas is gonna pop the link here in the chat, but you can also just Google NREL or DOE and slope, or type in this, uh, this link here. We've got the link in the chat now. So I invite you to follow along if you'd like and explore some of this data for your own community. And I'll try to show you how to get there and navigate through the site as we go. So again, um, Google or check out that link and I will now focus on the website and we'll talk through a live demo. Excited to share this with you. Okay, here we are at the main landing page, homepage for Slope. On this page, there's some um, links to stories that how other jurisdictions have used the data, instructional videos, and then all the information about it. You can set up an account where it will bring you back to your jurisdiction every time you log in. And you can share your email for us with us and we will share some updates and information with you as we revise and update the site. Again, instructional video here. Then there is the scenario planner. So here we are in the scenario planner. I'm gonna consolidate here. All right, <clears throat> let's tackle a jurisdiction. You wanna give me a county, Thomas? Any county. Let's see here. Well, the first, let's see, we've got Hancock County, Maine. Okay. All right, there it is. Cool. Let's take a look at Hancock County, Maine. So here's your control panel. Enter in your location here. And the default that comes up is down here. If you scroll down to the reference scenario. So what we're looking in, at in Hancock County, Maine is the reference case business as usual energy consumption. This is measured in BTUs here and then BTU. And what that consumption looks like over time for residential, commercial, and industrial electricity and non-electricity, as well as the transportation sector. This is transportation fuels on road vehicle transportation. So this is this does not include planes, trains, marine energy, but it does include on road vehicles. Um, so the blue that you see here, what we can learn from Hancock County, Maine is that I would say over half, well over half currently, and including into the future under a business as usual case, half of that energy consumption in this county is coming from on-road vehicles, um, particularly gasoline diesel, right? Which is this blue. You see a little tiny sliver of electricity here moving forward. That's gonna change. Um, moving forward, we have an update ready to go, which is gonna show the impacts of the Inflation Reduction Act and we see transportation electrification dramatically increasing just as a result of that legislation and the, all the various programs and incentives and rebates that are coming in for that. So this will be updated in the next in the coming months. But for now, we see Hancock, Maine has very high energy consumption in the transportation non-electricity sector. You can scroll over and see the specific modeled um, consumption amounts, and you can change the year. Um, here. And you can scroll down and see what are some of the assumptions going in here. So here are the specific numbers and what are the assumptions that we're, we're including in this reference case. So by 2036 here, we've got about 9% of vehicles are electrified. Wow, you've got a whole lot of renewable energy, 97% in a business as usual case by 2036. Uh, 97% and 41% reduction in energy related emissions by, from compared to 2005. 
So there's some planning metrics also just these are the assumptions in that scenario that you can reference. All right, let's take a look at some different scenarios for Hancock County, Maine. I'm going to do the scenario, a comparison view, and we're going to look at what that compares to for emissions. Close out this control panel. So here we have consumption, energy consumption, and what that means in terms of emissions. <clears throat> we see some interesting things going on here. Looks like you might have some state changes. The scenario planner includes data based on 2021, I believe, um, state legislation as far as renewable portfolio standards, for example, that are mandated. So sometimes you see that uh, emissions reflecting those changes. Okay, what happens if we change this scenario here and we look at, well, you've already got a lot of decarbonization. Um, which we saw in the planning metrics, what about high levels of electrification? Um, and I'm gonna switch the, so we're looking at emissions for both scenarios. Okay, so here in the reference case for emissions, we see still most of that emissions coming from transportation, but as you look at a widespread electrification in both the transportation and building sector, you see that most of that impact is coming in transportation emissions, right? So this huge emissions <laughs> from transportation, followed by residential non-electricity. I'm thinking heating oil, propane is a pretty big um, factor for this, this county. Um, widespread electrification has a huge impact in the transportation sector. So you see electricity coming in here in emissions um, in the light blue, but overall your emissions from transportation are declining rapidly. And let's take a look finally at, all right, what if you make sure that there's 95% grid decarbonization, this is in your electricity, oops. Um, well, we'll compare, right? Um, you can combine the two, but if you do grid decarbonization, you still have that huge amount of emissions from transportation in this county, whereas widespread electrification really tackles that and makes sure that it's decreasing. So that's just an example of one of the ways that you kind of look at your big picture um, context and understand the potential impact, particularly here, where you have a lot of grid decarbonization happening, even in the reference business as usual case, um, for anyone who's looking at transportation and electrification, you can use this data, you can use these images, just use it with attribution um, in presentations, in reports to understand and, and demonstrate and convey the potential impact here we see of widespread electrification, particularly in the transportation sector on emissions. Okay, that's the scenario planner. Um, <clears throat> So I want to make sure that I'm, I'm clarifying here. A lot of people get mis mistaken or confused about what we are actually showing. We're showing consumption. So I see here that the projections have solar percentage going up and down. This isn't generation that we're showing here, although we do have some data on that in slope. But what we're showing here is consumption. So we're attributing whatever is generated and those emissions that are you know, from the generation to the point at which it is consumed, whether it is um, residential electricity consumption, non-electricity consumption, commercial buildings, industrial, et cetera. So there's often that confusion that we're projecting how it will be generated, but actually we're attributing to the consumption, the point of consumption, because there you have a little bit more control as a local jurisdiction and decision-making program development project implementation. All right, we're gonna take a look at the data viewer and I'm gonna tackle with some pre-populated just because they're a little uh, hard to pull up really rapidly. I've populated this with several counties that I know are participating. I don't think they're participating here today, I'm not sure, but um, what we're looking at is in the data library, if you want to follow along, um, we're going to jump down to energy and environmental justice. This is the equity data. How can you target your 
project or your work or program to make sure that benefits are delivered to those populations who are, have the greatest needs, who are underserved, have had maybe less infrastructure investment over time, and how can we sort of redress some of those inequities? So first we're looking at social vulnerability index. We're looking at basically Navajo Nation, right? There are three counties here, um, but we're looking down at the census tract level. So you can search for your county and then take, switch to tract and you can see what kind of census tracts are there. What we're seeing here is on the map, where are the highest vulnerabilities? This is the Center for Disease Control Social Vulnerability Index and dark blue is the highest. A lot of vulnerability here. We're gonna check, I'm gonna do Cayenta count. Uh, this is a census tract, sorry. Um, Cayenta is where close to where the Navajo Generation Station, a coal generation plant was closed. So there's some impacts there. And we see that the highest vulnerability here is socioeconomic. We can scroll over and see that that includes households below poverty, unemployment, income, and no high school diploma. So those are social vulnerabilities that are the highest here in this census tract in, I believe it is Navajo County in Arizona and the Navajo Nation. So this is a way to just really drill down and identify where, you know, near or where your project is located um, and understand some of those socio-demographic information on who might be benefiting from this project and how you can maybe even target those benefits to serve some of these populations. You can also look at things like minority status and language, right? That includes communities that don't speak English um, or speak English less than well. So you might be looking at, okay, if you're having any interaction with the community, you might look at some community liaisons that can help connect with some of those um, communities and or translation services. All right, next up is household energy and transportation burden. This is looking at energy burden, which is described, defined as the percentage of household income spent on energy. And so we have household energy, which is energy bills, electricity, gas, and transportation. And we've intersected those. And so transportation burden is basically how much do households spend as a percentage of their income on primarily gas for their car. Um, so here we are in Jackson County, Illinois. I know that there's one count, uh, project um, team that is focused on this Carbondale area. And what we've done is in combining these two data sets where both are high burdens, we have dark blue. And so there's several census tracts here that have both high energy burdens 7.72 in this case, 6% and higher is considered energy burden, so spending a lot of uh, household income on energy bills. And then transportation is also high, it's a little bit different scale, but there's a big percentage of 5% going towards transportation fuel costs. Um, so that's a way to look at how to target and how to explain how your project might be benefiting some of these communities that have higher burdens and needs. And that's really helpful to, to focus down at the track level to understand that those differences on a neighborhood scale. Okay, now we're gonna look at another of these. So we're going through these, these different um, layers here in the energy environmental justice. So you can follow along by clicking on these different layers. We're now in single family home bill savings potential, right? So low and moderate income, single family homes. We've modeled what is the dollar savings potential by month for certain energy efficiency interventions. So anybody who's working on building efficiency, this might be helpful for you. And here we're looking at Lafayette um, in Indiana. This is Tippecanoe. I had to look up that county. Indiana, this is where there's a team that's called E.T. Foam Own Home <laughs> or something. They're looking at foam insulation. Um, and honestly, I found it interesting. There's a little bit lower uh, energy bill savings potential compared to some of their surrounding counties. Um, but they're still in Tippecanoe County energy bill savings um, for low and moderate income households of 31%. That's substantial, even though there can be higher elsewhere. 
And most of that bill savings is coming from electricity, where households, low and moderate income households can save um, $341 on average per year, sorry, per year, um, with this suite of energy efficiency interventions. So you can dig down into the details here to find out what those interventions are and how they might um, support households. So just way to, you can dig, dig down as deep as you want into all the research that's behind it. It's all accessible and available here. But a way to prove the potential for building energy efficiency for low and moderate income households here. And next up, we're gonna take a look at low and moderate income residential rooftop solar potential. There are some folks on the line here who are looking at rooftop solar. So here we are looking at the intersection of low and moderate income generation, again, technical generation potential, remember that term, and, the, um, and what kinds of income as well as tenure and building type that those households have. This is a way, again, to sort of focus in on those households and locations where there's the greatest potential as well as the greatest need. So here in, we are in, um, I'm gonna say this wrong, Cape Girardeau, Missouri, that's the county. And we're looking at the census tract level and we can see that the technical generation production potential here, right? is highest in some of these counties. This is basically where there are more low and moderate income households. So you'll have more roofed up um, area to build on. Um, but we also have data on this census tract in particular. How does that break down in terms of income, right? The potential is more on high income, but if you're targeted to lower income households, you can see that there's still a fair amount of blue, which is single family owner occupied. That's the easiest to develop a rooftop solar, right? You don't have to deal with a split incentive, et cetera. Um, so here on the moderate, low, very low income households, you can see the split of those building types and incomes. I also want to introduce you to this equity filter, which is available for, I believe, seven different layers, including this one. And here you can see this striped overlay and you can move these filters. So right now the default is pulling up no information on social vulnerability, but it is only showing this overlay where there are high household energy burdens as well as transportation energy burdens. So let's take off the transportation energy burden because we're looking at solar. Um, going slowly here. And we can see that just to the, to the east here, there's a lot of area where there is high average energy burden among households. Um, so where that solar could offset some of those bills. Um, so maybe that's a way to target your um, efforts to communities where there's some higher energy burdens. That makes sense. You can also look at where there are different social vulnerabilities um, without energy burden and see where those are located as well and set different types of social vulnerability. So that's the equity filter um, that you can look at to again, target your investments, projects, programs. Okay, that's what I wanted to cover in the energy and environmental justice. And let's move down now to the next one, economic indicators. We have clean energy jobs estimates. Now, if any of you are looking at what the, is the potential or opportunity in terms of job creation, uh, Texas was one of the um, areas where we have a participant and we're looking at the job growth potential for four different sectors. Um, and Texas has the highest, or is among the highest quintile here, right? Um, total job, uh, right now we're in, what year are we in? Um, 2020, by 2030, uh, 103,000 uh, clean energy jobs, right? Across wind, solar, energy efficiency, and storage in Texas. 
And then you can break that down by the different types of technology. So if you're looking at ground mount solar, maybe um, you can see that there's a potential for um, between 18 and 28,000 new jobs. And you can quantify your potential impact um, as it relates to the state potential that you're in. So that's jobs. Uh, let's take a look now at transportation. And we're gonna take a look at the, okay, Thomas, if you can give me a, a county where anyone's looking at a transportation project or electric vehicle electrification or sustainable transportation, anything related to that, if there is any, um, we'll take a look there. Well, let's see, I don't but see anything. Here we're, no, oh, no transportation. Okay, well, let's take a look at, oh, I don't know. Um, well, I can give you a county that uh, we haven't talked about. Sure, Someone how about that? Who's participating, uh, how about Hood River County in Oregon? That sounds great. Here we are in Hood River County. And we're looking at, the map is showing basically the overall vehicle count. So it's just population related. But what's really interesting here is, here's the different scenarios for vehicle registration data, right? So in Hood County, Hood River County, my apologies. Um, the most interesting piece here is what's gonna happen with your electric vehicle stock? Um, so we've taken some data that we purchased on vehicle registration, and we've mapped that out in a high electrification scenario, as well as a sort of business as usual scenario. And so basically these two blue lines are the business as usual, um, where you're looking at, oh, 4,800 battery electric vehicles, versus the high electrification, which is 16,000, right? So this is kind of your range of potential. This, the future will probably fall somewhere in between these two points, right? Um, as far as the number of electric vehicles registered in your county by 2050 here. And so you can use this kind of like technical generation potential as an upper bound for planning purposes, right? And whatever projects or programs or initiatives that you implement locally can influence where you end up between these two points. Um, so you, I wanna show you here um, that you can download all this data um, here on the controls right, this little arrow, and then you can share the link or save it somewhere, book note it. Um, and so this is how to use vehicle stock uh, potential changes for your county. And that's all we'll tackle for transportation. There's other information there. Let's move on down to energy efficiency. Is there any county that's working on a, an efficiency project? I don't see any here, but if anybody wants to throw their county in the chat, that would be Actually, great. Actually, you know, we're gonna, um, I'm gonna take a look at state data. Okay, and we just got uh, Athens, Ohio put in the chat, if you wanna try that. Oh, cool. Um, this is a state level data set. So let's just take a look at Ohio over there. Ooh, well, interestingly, um, Ohio has some of the highest single family home electricity savings potential. You see how it's dark green, which is in the top quintile for energy electricity savings potential. Um, so let's go to Ohio. And here you can see statewide, these are the cost effective, everything has a positive net present value that's showing up here the cost-effective interventions for residential single-family home electricity savings. Interestingly, in Ohio, upgrading electric furnaces, this is not a gas boiler, but electric furnaces to variable speed heat pumps when they wear out has, it looks like double the percent, the amount of electricity savings of any other measure in the state. So if you're looking at building efficiency, in Ohio, um, this has a really high potential, and this is a way to you know, 
promote your project, look at the potential here in your state. Um, it's followed by ductless heat pumps, um, replacing electric baseboard heat right now. Don't have to wait to wear out. It's cost effective to do that immediately. Um, so again, more heat pumps, um, then drill and fill wall insulation, basement insulation, et cetera. So this is a way to, again, build on NREL's world-class modeling capabilities and look at some opportunities and potential uh, in your state and what would have the greatest impact across the state. So that's an example of some of the energy efficiency data we can um, use here. Let's get down to renewables. I know a lot of you are interested in this. We're gonna start with utility PV. Any um, example of a county where there's uh, a solar project? I think I saw McLennan. Yeah, McLennan County, Texas. Doesn't, mm. let's see, yep, that's solar energy. I spell it wrong? McLennan, there, no two C's. Okay. Um, all right, here we are. McLennan County, Texas um, has some really high, uh, we're looking at utility scale PV solar potential, right? This is taking all suitable land in the county for utility scale PV generation combined with that resource potential, how much and how strong is that sunlight that's falling on that land? And you are among the top echelon with 128 gigawatt hours per year of utility scale solar generation potential. Interestingly, you have higher concentrating solar power generation potential um, than you have utility PV potential. This is the case in some counties. Um, and it's followed by distributed wind land-based wind, commercial rooftop PV, and residential rooftop PV. So um, very high compared to lots of other places. If you're in one of these lower like technical generation potential counties, you might think, okay, well, maybe it's, it might be easier to generate or, or develop in some other counties which have higher potential. But McLennan has a lot of large scale PV potential. I want to just flag that this is a logarithmic scale because we couldn't fit these two, these two top bars in um, with a regular scale. So just to note that this isn't quite as it appears. Uh, but again, you can download this data, you can screenshot this, you can use it in different reports and presentations. Um, but then uh, let's take a look at, um, I'm going to take one more look at residential rooftop PV. This has an air filter. So again, you can, a very high potential in McLennan County, Texas for residential rooftop PV. It is the lowest of the technologies that we consider here, um, but it is higher than many other counties um, in the state and country um, with 527,000 megawatt hours per year potential. So we can zoom in here and again, see those equity filters. Where might you target that PV? Looks like some areas in the center here have high um, energy burdens and social vulnerability. So that might be some areas where you could target any program that's looking at residential rooftop PV potential and projects. All right. Um, finally, is anyone looking at or considering hydropower? We're gonna take a look at um, the heat pump economic potential, which is an interesting one for those of you working on buildings. Um, so here we've got economic potential and the potential is all in the West. <laughs> Sorry, this is district heating. I missed, I meant to do um, heat pump. Um, here, it's not all in the West. Heat pumps are very effective in the Midwest, surprisingly. Um, you can see around Michigan um, and Chicago, et cetera. And finally, no, I'm hearing no, uh, no hydro counties, huh? Or states? I'm not seeing any here. All right. 
just in case anyone is looking at more types of renewals, I did see some other um, types of renewable projects. Um, this is a way to look at potential hydropower generation, right? Technical generation potential. Um, let's zoom in here to maybe something in Kansas. Um, I've selected non-power dams. So this is a way to look at, are there dams where there isn't power generation? How much generation could there be annually? You could install 20 megawatts here um, and generate a lot of renewable energy through powering a non-powered dam. So we have that mapped out throughout the country as well as new stream reach development, which is just a small impoundment within the floodplain um, and utility hydropower potential is, includes adding new turbines to existing hydropower plants. All right, that is a quick run through of the many, many um, building and energy efficiency as well as renewables and um, transportation data sets that we have on slope. And that gets us to some time for questions and answers. So I wanna keep this up here so we can explore while we hear some questions. But um, Thomas, do we have any questions that we didn't get to um, here? Today. Sorry, I was on mute. I have not seen any that have not been answered. So if anybody has questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat now. You can also come off uh, mute if you'd like to ask a question. Yeah, and if uh, folks are following along and they want to try to share your screen, if you have questions that you want to share with other people and, and give us the visual, um, we'll, we can try that as well. Oh, all right. I am not seeing or hearing any other questions. Um, so we maybe we just wrap up early and let you know that again, you can download this data. You can take screen captures. Um, I'll show you here. Most of these data sets have exactly how to cite them. Um, so they even plug in the date for you. Just copy and paste and uh, use it in your slides, reports, presentations, outreach education, if this is helpful for you. So, um, and again, download here on the controls and copy the links as well. And then all of these data sets have all the gory details, of where the data is from, you can source the original reports, et cetera, in this section down here. Okay, I really appreciate everyone's time and uh, hopefully it was um, thorough enough that that's the reason why you don't have any questions. Uh, but I do hope that this data and information can help you in your projects and best of luck in this uh, phase two competition with your work. Thanks so much for your time, everybody. I appreciate it.